There you go. Brilliant. So just to let you know, we, we tend to try to share these online as well afterwards that you get access to it because it can be a lot to, uh, you know, a lot to take in in, in one go. Um, so fantastic. It's not all about us, though. We are part of a growing team. We've got, as I mentioned before, offices in, in St Albans and, um, and in Cheltenham as well. Um, we are HubSpot partners, so a big part of what we do is, is the HubSpot piece. So we work with brands that have already got HubSpot, uh, but also those that are just perhaps aware of it or looking to adopt it as part of their, of their ongoing um, sales and marketing tactics. So let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about marketing funnels. Now, we hear about them a lot. You know, marketers talk a lot about funnels. Um, and we always think, well, we need, we need a marketing funnel. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, what if there was another way? I mean, we, we know this kind of model. I use this very, very regularly in a lot of webinars, a lot of um, client strategies, actually. And, and when we're building kind of advertising tactics, it's this kind of AIDA model. You've got that awareness closely followed by interest, desire, and action, okay? So this is very standard for kind of any customer purchase process, whether that's B2B or B2C. If I'm looking to book a holiday or I'm looking to buy, I don't know, stationary supplies for my corporate office of 200 people. Um, I start off with a degree of awareness. So I'm aware that I have this problem or I have this need. I know that there might be things out there, um, but the awareness is present. Then I develop an interest. So I start to look, I start to, to get more interested in what it is that I need. So again, if I'm booking a holiday, I'm starting to get interested about what options are out there. If I'm after stationery, maybe I'm looking at what the most cost-effective stationery could be to buy by bulk if I want a thousand staplers. Um, it's the job of the brand then to create that real want and to create the desire so that I'm looking at the marketplace, I'm looking at all these different businesses. Um, there's a number of options, maybe I've narrowed it down to five, but one of those businesses is gonna do the hard graft and the good marketing work to get me wanting, to give me that desire for that particular product or service. And then finally, I'm gonna take an action. So that could be that I am going to, um, to get in touch, to drop a line, to even convert if you're an e-commerce website that action could be as simple as a purchase but the point is is the problem with this is that it feels a little bit one way um it's got an ending it's got a conclusion okay the funnel ends um and it doesn't go any further and the truth is that marketing really is a lot more complex than that and a lot more exciting than that because it doesn't just begin and end from the point of awareness to the point of action that action point is simply one cog in the wheel and there's a lot more that happens after that as well we know that as customers so what if there was another way and what if instead of a kind of a funnel and a traditional um sort of marketing funnel we had something that's a lot more cyclical that is only as powerful as what you put into it um, that grows and develops with every piece of either financial or time investment that you give to your marketing activity and this is the case in point. So this is a HubSpot flywheel. Nick's gonna to talk to you a little bit more kind of later on sort of in the demo um, uh, part of the, of the webinar to kind of humanize this e even more, <coughs> excuse me. And we can show it you, <coughs> excuse me, show it to you more in practice. But in the meantime, let's just have a little look at this in isolation. So this is a far more cyclical process where we think of our customers beginning as strangers Maybe that's when they're in that awareness stage. They, they've got that problem. Then they become prospects. It's much more of an opportunity then. It's a lead. That could be a cool lead or a warm lead or even a hot lead. But the point is they're an exciting prospect. Then we get them to become customers. But the key part to this flywheel is that after that, they become promoters. OK, there is so much business that is lost by brands, by companies that I've worked with, by businesses that have come to me. There's a lot of business that gets lost after the sale process. And that comes through all that wonderful word of mouth, referral, all that other stuff that quite traditional marketing um, uh, sort of concepts, but that is driving back into that flywheel that's putting you in front of more strangers to generate more prospects, to get even more customers. And the reason why this is so important is because the marketing landscape, the digital marketing landscape is changing as well. 
To be competitive in search results is hugely challenging in, in 2022, perhaps more challenging than ever. Um, you know, PPC, Google Ads could be generating even higher costs to your business. So if we can engage people more, if we can give them the right message at the right time, we keep them excited pre and post sale. And in turn, we could be looking to generate, generate more business. So I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. So what does HubSpot say? Well, it says that the amount of energy or momentum that your flywheel contains is gonna depend on three things, right? One, how fast you spin it. Two, how much friction there is. And three, how big it is. Now that friction bit is key as well, because like with any wheel, any turning wheel on, 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 on your car, whether you've got, I don't know, a Tesla, like I know for a fact that somebody in the room does, or a Ford Fiesta. There you go, Nick, uh, a convert already, uh, an early adopter, if you like, still in terms of electric vehicles. That wheel is only going to turn as fast as the momentum that's working with it. If you jar it, if you jar that progress, if you hit a bump in the road, the whole system falls apart. And the same is going to be said for your sales and marketing alignment and the stuff that you do post-sale. So the most successful companies will adjust their business strategies to address all three of these elements. The speed of your flywheel increases when you add force to the areas that have the biggest impact. Forces are programs and strategies that you implement to speed up your flywheel. So what does that look like? Inbound marketing, okay? A freemium model, which is that lovely concept of join now, get a month free, and then we'll start charging you and you can cancel at any time. You know, frictionless selling, a smooth sales process customer referral programs, paid advertising, but also look at that last one there, investing in your customer service team. You know, these are all forces that will be feeding in to that sales and marketing flywheel. So by focusing on how you can make your customers successful, they're more likely to relay their success to potential customers. And you have to embrace that when you look at HubSpot, because you look at that central point, what does it all create? it creates growth. And I can vouch for that, that firsthand. I'm working with a business who hadn't even done any work previously on the post-sale process because their customers were, in many ways, there wasn't a, perhaps a huge amount of cross-selling opportunity. And so they weren't looking to resell and retarget to, to that particular customer. However, through HubSpot, they're now investing a huge amount more time and effort and communication in that post-sale period, especially over the first one to two months. And in turn, they're creating these fantastic brand ambassadors because those people cannot leave the brand. The brand is there and it's giving them so much more value. And what that's doing in turn is having a huge positive impact on referral. So that is a whole new access, a whole new route to market, purely based on the much better communication between the brand and the customer um, post-sale. So, Let's start looking at goals because it's all going to come back to goals. So it's unlikely that people are going to buy from you instantly. You might need to warm up your customers, start to build a relationship and then maintain that relationship. So you want to build brand awareness. That's going to be a key part of this. You want to provide value. So we're going to use the phrase quite a few times in this in this session about lead magnets, which are simply speaking, those pieces of collateral, those bits of value. It could be a PDF. It could be a document. It could be a video, for example. But perhaps it's behind a gateway so that somebody's going to download or access that content. And all they've got to do is drop in their details so that you have that lovely warm lead to be able to remarket to through automation. Um, Perhaps the one that excites me the most about these four is, is the whole concept of nurture and reward. You know, are we nurturing our customers? Are we rewarding them for their continued engagement with, with our brand? And ultimately, you know, is our, is our business going to grow? Because let's be honest, you know, from a marketing perspective, we want to be able to make sure that when we put money in, we're going to see something back in, in the long run. So what does that look like? So use that phrase earlier, account-based marketing. And uh, this is the route we're going to go down quite heavily with a lot of the HubSpot, the HubSpot stuff. For anybody who's seen that kind of Mad Men world, that kind of advertising revolution of the 1950s, it's all based upon mass messaging. 
isn't it? So old school advertising is the concept of going, yeah, we'll take out a banner ad, or we'll take out, I should go even, even broader than that. We'll take out a newspaper advert. We'll take out a magazine advert. We do it every year. It costs us about nine and a half grand. Um, what do we get back for it now? We don't know, but we do it. You know, the salesperson is pretty nice. You don't know who's seeing that. You don't know if the message is appropriate to the right person. Even some aspects of digital marketing and online presence are still very, very broad. We pay for our Yell listings, you know, we, we, we put money into these different places and we just, we just sort of trust in the fact that the brand is out there. What about if there was another way? What about if we took a far, far more targeted approach? So that old school approach we can see on the left hand side, that's the concept of fishing with nets, okay? It's coming back to that AIDA stuff. We get the message out there. We look at all these different brands that we wanna see. The interest comes in through kind of some inbound marketing. Um, then we nurture them and then we get that kind of lead, lead conversion. But what about if we went even more targeted? and we started fishing with spears, okay? So we started really going after those businesses or those individuals or those opportunities that we really, really want. It's a slightly reversed approach. It starts off by identifying those key accounts. So this is particularly prevalent if you're B2B. There could be 20, 30, 50, or 100 target accounts that you wanna go after. Then you go even deeper. You identify the stakeholders within that business. Who are they? What are they about? You know, uh, Who's the key decision maker? Is there a chief financial officer involved? If there is, is that a good thing? Or is that person gonna be a barrier to success? From there, do we start nurturing that lead with perhaps verbal communication, written communication, but also marketing content and marketing collateral? And then finally, do we, do we convert that person? The truth is that it's not always as simple as going, we do one or the other. We might do a healthy combination of the two. We might make sure that we've got a really good balance of marketing communications, online visibility, brand awareness to bring in those inquiries. But then from there, are we actually doing something very, very valuable with that inquiry? So that it doesn't just end up as a general inquiry in an email inbox, but it falls into a system, into a funnel, uh, it's filtered based on the industry type or the type of business so that then we can go that little bit deeper, identify those contacts, nurture those leads with automation and automated content so that your life is no more stressful or no busier. And then finally, um, you've, got a, you've got a conversion. A lovely analogy actually on that busier bit. I actually had perhaps the best possible bit of feedback from a client, um, a HubSpot client actually. They said, um, my phone's not ringing as much and that's such a good thing. Now, normally I'm working so hard with clients going, we want to get the phones busy. We want to get the leads coming in. We want to get the inquiries going. This particular client said, you have no idea how much easier my life is because of this. I'm not having to speak on the telephone as much. I'm not having to engage with the kind of the cross-selling aspect in the same way because it's working through this automated, automated funnel and, and through HubSpot. And again, we'll come on to what that looks like in, in a little bit more detail. If you've got any questions, by the way, don't hesitate to pop them in the chat as we go. Uh, my colleague Bex will keep an eye on that as well. So that if there's anything that you do just want to want to fire in, please don't hesitate. Sometimes if the questions are also uh, personal to your business, I totally understand if you'd rather do that privately, you can send me a private question in the chat. Um, but we will also open it up to the room at, at a couple of intervals. So goals, let's be, let's be that marketing superhero. Let's not um, do that broad stuff. Let's not just expect that we're gonna put some ads out there and we're gonna get some messaging out there and people are gonna buy from us. Let's look at what that end goal is and how we're actually gonna get there. So we need to identify that. And normally from a marketing perspective, it can very easily come down to two, two simple goals. One is client acquisition, perhaps if you're B2B and if you're B2C, you're gonna be kind of product or, or service sales or, or whatever that might look like. So it's acquisition and sales. Those will tend to be your overarching business goals. What they look like in terms of volume and time and where we wanna be is on a business by business basis. But let's look at all those marketing touch points of how we actually get there. Sales forms, contact form inquiries, telephone calls, PDF downloads, demo bookings, online quote generation, newsletter signups, successful purchases, or brochure requests. Now, the thing is, some of these we go, oh yeah, we, we do this already, we do that. But you'd be amazed at how many opportunities you're losing in the way that you're doing those things. So going back to the beginning, the sales form, you know, what's happening with that 
lead? Is it going into an automated system so that they're getting what they need 24 hours later, but then also a week later, a month later? The same with the contact form inquiries. Yes, are they getting that instant response of, you know, um, thank you for getting in touch. Somebody will be in touch with you within 24 to 48 hours. But then is that also falling into a system, a process, so that they can have some really effective email marketing and content that's going to follow up? Telephone calls, yeah, quite a strong uh, lead generation opportunity. Are we then taking that information, though, and putting it into an automated funnel so that, again, we let something like HubSpot do the work for us and we get notifications, we get reminders a month later from the sales process. So are we doing the right thing with that lead or is that lead not going to turn into anything and do we need to cut it there? PDF downloads. Are we developing collateral content and white papers that is more specifically targeted to the right industries? OK, so what I mean by that is, you know, are we making sure that if we want to target people in the in the health and fitness industry, that we've got a document that's specifically targeting the health and fitness industry? If we want to target people who are, um, uh, you know, in, in acquisition, are we making sure that we've got collateral that is designed for people within that industry so that they're landing on the right content and they're getting the right content sent to them through email marketing as well. Online quote generation is a fantastic, fantastic marketing tool. I've worked with businesses where an online quote generator, something that's built into the website, can be one of the best ways to pull people into that engaging funnel. They're on there doing the maths and doing everything, you know, in front of their own eyes. And they're able to just see those quotes and to see the kind of numbers. But even better than that, you're getting the lead coming through to you so that you can actually see, you know, who it is that's engaged and got a quote for the product or the holiday or the service or whatever that that might look like. And they're in a funnel. They're in a marketing funnel for email communications as well. And then, uh, you know, things like newsletter signups. Yes, of course, successful purchases um, and then brochure requests. But why the successful purchase bit is key is coming back to that post post sale um, uh, process. Once they have bought that product or bought that service, are we making sure that we're doing the very best that we can to turn those people into brand ambassadors and lead generation machines? You know, are we contacting them for reviews? A great example of, of where this worked to me as a consumer. And again, this is this is where it's going to all line up and it all makes sense in terms of the HubSpot demo as well. But I um, uh, went to a shed company um, for a shed and it was a pretty good, you know, reputable shed company. They had a, a pretty old school website, but a very good online presence. The content was really good. You could do your own designs. They had some of that sort of stuff built in as well. And they had great kind of customer service. They were called Beast Sheds, right? So check them out. A bit, a bit of product placement there, Beast Sheds. And, um, and, and does exactly what it says in the tin, in that these sheds are supposed to be great timber, well built, hard locks, good stuff. But I was amazed at their post conversion process, actually. And from the moment that I made a sale, I was being prompted to leave a review. The shed hadn't arrived yet. And that shed was going to come in like a week's time. OK, now at first point, you go, well, hang on a minute, that's ridiculous. Like, how can my customers aren't ready to leave a review? They haven't used my product yet they, they, or they haven't engaged with my service. I can't ask them for a review for at least three months. But guess what? Up to this point, everything was running incredibly smoothly. So they asked me for a review automated by email. They didn't just ask me for a review. They said, if you leave us a review, when you get your shed, we'll give you a hoodie. Just let us know your size and you'll get you'll get a hoodie with this cool logo and all that sort of stuff. I went on to leave a review. And guess what? Ninety nine percent of the people who had left reviews and they had hundreds of reviews hadn't even had their shed installed yet. But because of the incentivization and the automation and the timing that that request had come through the moment that somebody made a sale, uh, a purchase, sorry, people were going on and leaving reviews. And, and, the, and the process at that point had been so good that all those reviews were five star. And I had my shed and the shed was excellent. 
so that no dramas there and everybody's happy. But the point is, is it's just to think about, are we maximizing through automation, the opportunity to build our brand, to build all these wonderful um, kind of trust signals as well, so that we're asking people to leave reviews at the right time. And if necessary, we're incentivizing. And again, all of that can come through workflows that Bex will be talking about a little bit um, in terms of how we, how we actually get there. So ABM, to wrap that up, you know, it's about creating customized marketing campaigns tailored to specific customers. It's going to align marketing with sales. It's the right people in the right context. But ultimately, we're being more intelligent now and we're not spreading ourselves too, too thinly. We're focusing on the right area. So going back to that example, they're getting the right message to me, to that particular individual in a certain context, in the right environment at exactly the right time to get me to do that action. Broadly speaking, this is the difference, okay? All of these communications feel much more one-to-one -one than one-to-many. The shed review, the personalized way that comes through to me, how that all happens, the concept of um, uh, the post-sale nurturing process can be done automation, but much more personalized. And that whole process is gonna put your brand much closer to your customer. So what I'd like you to do now as a quick activity, and it's often very useful if you feel comfortable to literally pop this in the chat and we can even throw it up to the room or send it to me personally, if you'd like it to be anonymous, but maybe we can just use a couple as examples. Jot down those marketing touch points. How do customers know your brand? You know, what does their journey actually look like? What's the first point of contact to the last? Does it end at point of sale? Okay, I'm gonna do it for myself but I'd love us to take two to three minutes. Feel free to scribble it down, but I'd love you to pop it in the chat or to send it to me personally and I'll use it anonymously. Um, what are those marketing touch points? If I thought ahead, I'd have had the countdown music on at this point. So I, I'll, I'll allow you to choose your own background music for that process, but Bex has just privately messaged me and said that she's quite happy to give you her own rendition of it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite aggressive when you get to the da 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 bit. Brilliant. I've already, I've had one just come through privately, so bear with me. I'll just give it another minute. And as I say, feel free to, I've had two come through privately. So thank you for that. And then um, give us another minute and feel free to, yeah. Marvellous, I've just received another, so thank you. Brilliant. Feel free to carry on jotting down if you want to contribute or send any, but I'll start going based on a couple of the things that have started to come in because it's, it's really, really interesting. So um, one that's come through is based on the fact that the website, uh, in, sorry, bear with me. This, uh, brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Okay, interesting. So um, interestingly, there's a couple here that have come through where the website is not the first uh, point of contact. And that's key. So often we think of our website as the very first touch point. So we, we think about our SEO. We go, are we ranking for the right keywords? Are we pulling in the right people who are searching in, in the marketplace? And are they landing on our website? But interestingly, the website is not always going to be that first point of contact. 
if your customers are um, perhaps it's a big B2B network and there's a lot of branded search for your brand. So for example, if I have a business called Dan's Automobiles and it's a, a leading manufacturer of, um, of vehicles within the UK, if people are heavily referring that, there might be two, three, four, 500 searches for that brand a month. Now those people are already aware of my, excuse me, of my brand. But then when they land on the website, are they getting the right content? So the content is less about keywords, it's less about SEO, but it's more about collateral, white papers, downloads, guides, guides to purchasing a car. You know, perhaps there are ways of us hooking those people in with content and it's less about drawing that kind of uh, people in through awareness and more about, um, um, as I say, about giving them the right value because that website is the second, the second point of contact. Um, another one that's come through that's really interesting is that some uh, a brand is already doing a lot of work with review acquisition. So very, very heavily targeting for reviews post purchase. Um, uh, there's two things, actually reviews post purchase and a referral incentive once they've completed their experience with that brand. Now, that's another lovely one. And when we think about automation, um, let's say you're a um, hypothetically speaking uh okay let's say you're uh, uh um here's a good one let's say you're an estate agent just to really think outside the box okay look at what the property purchase process looks like that takes time doesn't it it takes several weeks at the earliest you know a very easy sale might take eight weeks from the point of putting in an offer to actually completing on a, on a, I don't know, a two or a three bed house or something like that. And that's at the low end of the scale, you know, the upper end of the scale, if you're in a chain, it could be months. Okay. So what about if you were be enabled to get communications to people through automation at different points in their journey so that you might be actually asking them to review the estate agent or the conveyancing firm, if you were a, a, perhaps a lawyer involved, you know, you might have actually engaged with that client for the first time in the January, but you might be dropping them communications after a trigger's happened in the March or the April time, if they've had a successful move or, you know, everything went well with the property. Um, it's just something to think about in terms of how that automation can come in at those different points in the, in the journey. Um, so with this example, yes, somebody was asking for reviews, but that referral incentive, let's say you're a cruise provider and you do high end cruises, you know, is somebody booking that and doing the cruise six months later? Are we then going back in going time to book up for next year? And guess what? We're going to give you 10 percent off because it's an early booking. You know, is that being triggered at the right time so that you're just pulling people back in? You know, they, they can't not engage more with with your brand you're going to increase the lifetime value of those current customers but also you're going to generate a lot more customers um, as a result of it brilliant so thank you to everyone who, who, who sort of sent across with that and as i say feel free to keep any of those thoughts coming in on the public chat but also don't hesitate to, to message me um, directly so um let's talk a little bit more now about target accounts let's go a bit more targeted so if you haven't done this already, I highly recommend um, you do this. We tend to do this with um, um, the majority of our clients who are, I suppose, B2B and have a certain level of engagement already with their brand. Um, it's a great bit of insight, this. It's on LinkedIn. So all you need to do really is have like um, a LinkedIn ad account, but you don't actually have to run any ads or spend any money. And you can benefit from something called the insight tag. And the insight tag is super, super useful because all it does is you pop it on your website. It's a bit like the Facebook pixel, which we're, we're quite aware of. Um, and it will give you insight into who's engaging with your uh, brand, with your LinkedIn, um, with, with the website based upon what company they are or who they are um, because of their LinkedIn, their LinkedIn login. Now, obviously, there are things like cookies and, and cookie uh, restrictions that can stifle a little bit of the data that we get from this sort of thing. And so you also need to reach a certain minimum number. So that's why I say it's about it's not just about how many people are. Uh, it's not just about who's engaging with the website. It's that you've got enough minimums to order to be able to actually get get the data. But for example, I've got a couple of screenshots here just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So you could be targeting all those websites. Uh, website visitors and it can tell you things like the brand okay so you can see in this little screenshot here the type of businesses that are actually engaging with 
your website. And what's interesting is that you can see trends off the back of this. This screenshot is very low, low sort of percentages. Um, so it shows that it's quite thinly spread. But I've seen reports with quite hefty numbers where, you know, you might have a key account or a business that's actually accounted for kind of 2% over the last month or something like that. Now, why this is really why useful, is really as, useful as, as, well, as well is that it's going to enable you. Enable... Sorry, I'm just getting a bit of kickback. Thanks. Um, is that it's going to enable you to um, to actually, as I say, see and engage with the businesses. There might be accounts here that you're already talking with. So there could be brands that are already in, in the funnel or they could be businesses that you hadn't even thought about that, but then you see that they're within your target industry and guess what? They've been on your website. And actually then what you have is a very clean and easy opportunity to start doing your research, to look at who those people are from that particular business. Um, are they a good opportunity? Could we then start to identify the stakeholders within that business? Because guess what? It goes even better. It gives us and we can filter not just the name of the business or the type of industry vertical that they work in, but we can see the actual um, uh, position position of that person. So in this example, we've got CEO followed then by social uh, media marketing specialist and social media um, assistant. Uh, what's really interesting in this screenshot, I don't mind sharing this with you, is that this one is from kind of a, a Wagada report that I did. So what's really interesting about that is when you look at that at a glance, actually it's, 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 it's actually really interesting because those three make up the decision making unit for a lot of the businesses that we work with okay so when you think about it the ceo will tend to be the um that final kind of decision maker the person who's um if it's a relatively small business they might be owner founder and ceo if it's a bigger business then obviously they're they're still involved with the knowledge of what's going on in terms of those key decisions of spend You've then got something like a social media marketing specialist and a social media assistant. If they're a social media client, very much they would work in and feed in to the type of people that we then work with on the ground with our clients. So it gives you an idea that you're able to understand the type of people and the businesses that are engaging um, with, with your website. And then what we can do is start to take that data, take that information and, and piece together our content marketing plan. So I've mentioned lead magnets to you. Now, lead magnets are going to be perhaps some of your most useful tools for um, account based marketing. And they can take the form of so many different things, as I say, like white papers and guides and reports. I'm working with the B2C uh, business where we're generating the most useful kind of guides, tools on how to do X, Y, Z that are loosely involved within the industry. But it's a fantastic engagement piece for customers. It's a great cross selling opportunity. Um, but the point is, is it hooks people in and it keeps them engaged and it also enables you to understand who's engaged. Content marketing. Now, I don't just mean written content. Really think about in 2022, um, your video content. Think very, very carefully about video content marketing and how that can feed into all of this, okay? You could even have the same message in a 30 second or a one minute video, but you could even do four or five versions of that video that are simply speaking to a different industry. OK, but rather than it all being in the same place with the same noise, maybe you even have five dedicated landing pages for that video calling all um, manufacturers, calling all suppliers, calling all distributors. If, if you're working in that kind of industry and make sure that it's, you know, the ultimate guide for distributors on the ultimate guide for manufacturers on. You might find that the core part of the content makes sense for all those different verticals, but have them on those separate landing pages that are really heavily focused towards those different, those different industries. Now, remember with that, I'm not talking SEO now. So I'm not going, you know, which of these are gonna be the best keywords for the best industries and are they gonna rank in X, Y, Z? Without getting too technical, you might even de-index some of these from Google so that Google can't even see these landing pages. But the point is that you might use them in your marketing. So then if you're in an outreach on LinkedIn and you're in a communication with somebody, you can go check this out. It's going to be super useful. I'm going to send it your way. Drop them a direct message with that landing page and then they can be downloading it. They can be engaging with it. But the point is, it's a very, very targeted marketing um, tactic. 
It's going to enable you to build those relationships. So all these things that I'm talking about, the review requests, the cross selling, the, uh, the financial reductions, the valuable video marketing content, the guides, the how to's, all of that is going to enable you with your with your relationship building in a much, much more more targeted way. But the most important part of all, and this is what you're going to see in practice, is how we can automate this how we can automate this process so that just like my client that was buzzing because their phone was ringing less um, you can still achieve the same or more but with less of a demand and less of a pressure on your on your time i'm going to hand you over to bex now who's going to talk you through a bit more detail what that actually means and what that looks like and how a workflow actually works if you've got any questions pop them in the chat i'll keep an eye out but bex over to you Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. So, yeah, Dan's spoken a lot about automation and kind of the reasons behind why you might do or use automation um, within your businesses. Um, as he kind of touched on as well, the absolute key to good automation is making sure that you're providing value at both ends. So you're providing value to your business in terms of um, efficiency and saving time and getting out those communications um, when you need to, to who you need to, but also providing value to the person that you're talking to as well. And that's where a lot of people fall down with their automation and their automation becomes quite spammy sometimes. I think we've all been in a situation where I certainly have, where you sign up for something on a website once and 50 years later, you're still receiving communications from them that have absolutely nothing to do with the pair of shoes that you bought before. So what we want to do with automation and what HubSpot's what's really great at doing through its tools is personalizing that process and making those automations much more personal to the original contact that the person had with you. So what you can see on your screen, or you can hopefully see on your screen, because it's come out a lot smaller than I had intended it to, is how we designed a workflow. Um, and Thank you. How we designed a workflow and an automation process for one of our clients who they were already doing a really good job at um, producing those lead magnets that I was talking about. So they had some great content on their website already. Um, they had podcasts, they had white papers, they had case studies, and all of that content was dated. So they were collecting data from the people that were downloading these assets from. But then what they were doing with that data was a little bit haphazard for want of a better term. So whatever somebody had downloaded, whether it was a podcast on a product or whether it was a case study on a service, they always got the same follow-up communication. Um, and they got that communication in um, no particular timeline. It was when marketing got around to sending it out. And as I say, they just, everybody got the same thing. It, it wasn't personalized. So what we wanted to do there was just make sure that we could personalize that communication to the people that were getting it and expedite that lead gem process for the sales team. So that the sales team weren't wasting time talking to people that really didn't have an interest in the product. They just wanted to listen to that one podcast once. So the first step before we even went into HubSpot was to design what that process was gonna look like. And on this slide here, what you can see is kind of a two-way flow. On the left-hand side, we looked at people that downloaded that first asset, but then didn't engage with the follow-up content. So we set timeframes. We made sure that we were contacting them regularly. So in this case, it was a seven-day delay between the content that we sent them. Um, but if after a couple of weeks and a few emails, they still weren't downloading anything, we sent them to a point where we said, are you still interested? And if, we were, if they weren't, we gave them an opt-out because then they haven't got a bad taste in their mouth about us. We haven't been spamming them, but we've given them what we think might be relevant to them and it might, might prompt them to come back to us later. But the sales team haven't wasted any time and they're not getting, um, getting a bad taste in their mouth about us at all. At the other end of the scale, and if you look along the top of this um, diagram here, if after that first email we sent them, they did immediately download that next recommended piece of content, we wanted to, as I said, expedite that process. So the system then will automatically send out the next scheduled piece of content straight away. And we, again, we can track it. So we, we saw if they downloaded it again, then we sent out the next piece of content. 
And we kept them engaged while they were still in the mood to be um, taking in that information and kind of drew them through that funnel of awareness and um, educated them on what else we might be able to bring to them. Now, if they kept doing that, we then automated a task to be sent to one of the sales team immediately to follow up with them. So to give them a call, when we know that they've just opened that email, that they've been engaging with that email for the past two or three days. And we, within that um, prompt and that task to the sales team, we were also able to give them information on what had been downloaded, um, when it had been downloaded and what they have engaged with. So it gives the sales team um, a bit more of a, a bit more ammunition, if you like, to go into that, um, go into that conversation much more confidently and much more personalised to the person that they're talking to. So there's other bits in the middle as well. So we also created flows so that if people did start engaging or stop engaging at any point, they can go in different ways. But the key to this is making sure that your sales team and your marketing team are working efficiently and that you're drawing through those leads that are really going to be a, a positive impact to your business. Um, we're going to have a look a bit later on when we go into um, into HubSpot as well as to how that actually looks. And we'll have a look at how we um, how we designed one for that post-sale process as well that Dan was talking about. So it doesn't just have, need to happen at the start of the funnel, it can happen at the end as well. So we'll have a look at that later. But at this point, is that all making sense to any, everyone? Has anyone got any questions or even opinions at this point about automation and how it might work within, within their businesses? Just pop it in the chat or... Raise your hand if you're, if you're not feeling too shy. Yeah, feel free, folks. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to unmute. It's absolutely fine. And um, I'll just give it a couple of secs. That was brilliant, uh, Bex. It's a good insight there. No problem. I'll keep an eye on chat in case one or two come through. But no, that's excellent. Thanks, Bex. Um, yeah, so hopefully as... Uh, Sorry, I was muted then. Yeah, as you can see, um, this is going to really help visually perhaps explain how that system can be even more personalized, so that it's not just that mass messaging at any point, but it is about making sure that they're going down the right path, down the right funnel. And I know we talked a little bit about funnels at the start. Ultimately, this is another form of, of, of funnel. But the point is that through all of this, you're going to be creating much better brand ambassadors, people that are more engaged with the brand to cross sell, to to upsell to or to rely on them to actually, you know, make those those lovely referrals and, and generate more business as well. Um, and yeah, to generate more business and generate the conversion. So how to actually get marketing and sales aligned? Well, you know, your action points, I suppose, to be really starting to think about a bit more after today, some of the gaps just to kind of fill those in, is your customer persona stuff. You might not have done very much work on that to this point, or maybe you have. If you have, it's very, very, very useful. If you haven't, then it's really going to help you, okay? And by customer persona, I mean really digging deep into into the needs the wants the habits of your customer you know uh, or prospect when are they online when they're online what does that look like are they engaging with your content on mobile or is it on their desktop are they a parent are they out of action during the school run what are they like for dinner you know give them a name i'm working with a brand where we've developed a, a really strong customer persona and we've given that person a, a non-gender specific name because we're building the persona based upon the industry and the industry types. So it could be he, it could be her, it's whoever that person is, but they've got all these other attributes. And I can picture that person right now um, in my mind's eye. So build out those personas because it's really going to help you to, to develop, um, develop your content. Check this out, we'll send the deck over. This actually links through. So there's also like a free account planning template from HubSpot, make the most of as much free stuff as you can get. It's always good. So go in, have a little look. You can access that resource. It's like a strategic template for your ABM sales um, and management as well. So that will help kind of give you some of those ideas. But as I say, this is this can be linked through to from, from the deck and we'll, we'll make sure you, uh, you get a copy of that. But what else can you start going away and thinking about? Your pipeline, you might already have this. You might have this in an Excel. You might have, you know, client details. You know, start to categorize them. Who are these people? Are they a cold caller or are they a qualified lead? Are they the main stakeholder? Do I need to speak to somebody else? What's the anticipated lead time from inquiry to sale? You know, how long is this gonna take? Um, 
again, I think examples are always great, but I'm working with quite a large scale business that are doing this at the moment off an Excel and they need to move it onto a proper CRM system, a proper customer relationship management system. And, that, and that's what we're working with them on at the moment. But the point is you can start to do this work initially to start to build out your understanding of your, of your client base, your customer base, and what you might need HubSpot to, to do for you. And something that is often dramatically lacking, well, that's quite a, a harsh assumption, tends to lack in businesses that have been established for a very, very long time or have grown from a traditionally sales driven background. It can be very hard to effectively coordinate marketing and sales. OK, now is the time to get those two together. I did a webinar a few months ago and we talked about them. LinkedIn did this lovely thing where they called marketing and sales the ultimate power couple, okay? Think about, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Obama. Um, think about, you know, Ryan Reynolds and what's his name? The other chap who have just brought Wrexham FC, you know, however you want to look at it, think of it as that power couple where the two are working in, in, hand, in, in, in tandem. And then, you know, are the sales team equipped with the right marketing collateral? So are we giving them all these wonderful resources that they can use? And is our HubSpot lead gen set up to drive maximum inquiries for the sales team to handle? And again, harking back to that example with Bex, are we giving that sales team the ammunition? Are we making their job that bit easier with the right triggers so that they know exactly what's going on so that they can go in and give the right message to the right person um, at the right time? And something that it doesn't so much fall under HubSpot, but so needs to filter into all of this is ensuring that your sales team and those key stakeholders across the business have a strong individual identity. Um, it never ceases to amaze me still how much work can be done on people's LinkedIn profiles, LinkedIn presence, LinkedIn outreach. This is going to underpin everything that you're doing from a marketing perspective. And it's so important, especially when we talk about account-based marketing, you'd be amazed how many people will be landing on and engaging with your, your LinkedIn profile. And if it doesn't look good, if the synergy is not there, if it's not giving the right message, then again, it, coming back to that flywheel thing, think about that friction. Are we providing friction? If that customer's LinkedIn experience isn't great with me, guess what? That's my little bump in the, in the road. That's my, that's my friction point. And then the most important aspect of all, perhaps, is ensuring that you have those shared goals. So set those business objectives that I spoke about at the beginning. Set those clear marketing objectives. So what do we want? How are we going to get there? Differentiate and interlink. Identify which of those objectives sit with sales and which of those objectives sit with marketing. And make sure those teams or those individuals know that and then they're accountable for it. They're accountable for success. It's no good putting pressure on your salespeople if they're going, but the marketing team haven't provided us with what we need. And likewise, it's no good putting pressure on your marketing team to generate more business if they're actually creating a huge amount of engagement and lead gen and the sales team's conversion rate is too low. So you need to identify where those gaps are, what is and isn't working, differentiate and interlink. So you don't need to share these, but this is just something for you to think about afterwards as well as a bit of an activity before I kind of just hand you over to Nick to kind of wrap up on this element and open into what's going to happen after uh, a quick coffee break. So um, I would really encourage you to jot down two or three overarching business objectives. So that could be revenue goals, growth goals, sales targets over a certain period. Jot down two or three marketing objectives so they might be you want to get more people to the website you want to get them engaging more with your social media you want to have them downloading more white papers but the point is do they differ because they should they should be different but are they aligned because they will also need to align okay one feeds into the other so it's just something to think about to focus the mind and, and look at it from from a more um strategic perspective So what I'm going to do now is if anybody has any um, questions on that, don't hesitate to pop them in the chat. Don't hesitate to pop them privately or to send me a message during the break as well. That's absolutely fine. But what I'm going to do now is bring a close to the kind of that section, which is giving you a bit of an overview and that sort of account based marketing and ABM side of things. Um, and now I'm going to hand you over to Nick who's going to just give you some food for thought and perhaps ask a couple of questions to, to, to scope out how we can make sure that the second half is then tailored to, to meet some of wherever your gaps are or where it is that you're looking to build as well. So thanks, folks. I'm going to hand you over to Nick.
Thanks, Dan. So um, what I'm, my plan is, is to really give you a bit of an overview, a flavour of how HubSpot can implement all of those tactics that Dan spoke about and Dan and Beck spoke about. Uh, and I'm going to show you those in practice. Um, now, HubSpot is a, it's, it's a CRM, which is what, how I would describe design for the technophobe. So, uh, you know, if you think of that kind of swan, very serene up top, underneath it's, it's uh, very complicated, but on top it's very easy to use. There's a lot of functionality in there. What we wanna focus on today is how it can help you in relation to the sales funnel. So there's lots of functionality in there I'm not gonna go into today, but perhaps if there's anyone who's got specific questions or areas that they want to look at within the system, um, what I'd like to do is maybe just take a two, three minute comfort break um, so just to get everyone to get a coffee um, and then maybe come back. And if anyone then wants to share with me anything or sorry, sh share with me now before we go into that, um, any ideas of what they want to look at. When I'm going through the presentation, I will try to then share and focus on those particular areas. And then at the end of it, maybe we just do a quick Q&A session afterwards and um, uh, and then hopefully it will make a lot of sense to you. So yeah, if I can just open up the floor quickly and just ask if, if there is any particular functionality um, that, that anyone wants to look at. Okay. I feel like Thomas was about to give us something there, but I'm not sure whether it was a, an elbow bump or a... <laughs> I was going to. I, I, I saw some other people unmute as well, so I didn't oh, want sure, to join. Sorry. I didn't want to join the, the barrage of people. Um, kick us off! Kick us off! One, one off. of the things I was I wanted to, uh, or, or uh, from from my um, company's perspective, is we don't operate on a huge scale of of contacts. One of one service of ours can can very much be enough um, from a sales perspective. For one whole year so we are not somebody that like i think you said it quite well is casting nets that's not something we need to do is very much just more targeted styles and it's just one account so really my my concern is i with especially from a system and hubspot aspect um it's always been okay to manage it manually in the past because it's not been so big but we're looking to improve it and my kind of concern is that I'm not going to have a huge amount of people anyway. I'm, you know, 10 people is far enough to, to work with. And in my concern is, is HubSpot, can it manage that from a smaller basis and get enough out of it still? Perfect. Yeah, we're talking about that, uh, Thomas, no worries. Yeah, top of that, that's the same from what my guys, you know, it, one could be worth millions of me, just go over like a, a whole year so I don't, I don't need that many either so it's kind of the same situation as Thomas. Okay perfect yeah I think there's a there's a few uh, elements around that which are worth discussing um, so I will show you where the power of it is um, uh, and how the system is scalable so yeah we'll talk about that. Just a quick one okay. uh, we, we basically on a mass media so like uh, we are a travel company and uh, does it like currently we're using a CRM? So if we send an email out to a customer, we want to track at what time have they opened their email? Because a lot of times when you're sending an email, it goes to a spam folder. So what we tend to do is we send them an email out at the same time we send them a text message. So in case it goes to a spam folder, we need to ensure because A, it costs us X you know, amount to get a lead say 60, 70 quid to get a lead in. We need to ensure that he has a chance by actually opening the email. And then we want it to be notified. So like we get a notification, the customer's e open an email, then sales team can then call about it in one hour's time. Just a follow-up that you get a chance to check the email, not knowing that we've done that. It just helps in the whole sales process. Plus, is it easier for a two-way message in in, in regard in, in, in the way we can send out text messages, the customer can text us back, back as well, because a lot of times people don't want to be on the call because they're very busy. They want to just chat before they commit to talking to you over the phone. Is that possible on HubSpot? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some really clever stuff with that, Shebang, as well. Some really good stuff we can do with that. Perfect, perfect. So 
what I'm going to do, I'm not going to be looking at the camera because I've got my big screen in front of me, so I'm going to look slightly away. So if that's a bit disconcerting for anybody, I apologise. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, navigate around the system. I want to, I'm kind of going to break it into a couple of different sections, really. I want to just show you how easy it is to navigate around the system um, and how you can customise the system. And then I'm going to go into some of the functionality that we've talked about and hopefully bring to life um, all the elements that uh, Dan and Bex talked about. So, um, and as I said, do ask questions if, uh, if there are any pressing ones through or we'll do a Q&A at the end. So this is kind of a, one of the opening screens that you're able to have within HubSpot. And um, you're actually able to customize the, the opening screen to demonstrate yeah, reports. Sorry, yep. I, well, I can't see your screen. I don't know if everybody else can. You can't see my screen? I can see. I can see. Me then. I think there's two. I think there's two shared screens. If you click the view options at there the top, go. I think Dan thank, still shared the screen. <laughs> oh, Sorry, Nick. Uh, let's try again. How's that? Any better? Right, I've got you now. Hopefully, I've got that Perfect. as well. Everyone else? Yeah. Okay, yep, lovely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, right. So, yeah. So, um, I've got my opening screen set with just a, a, a report page uh, where, for those that, uh, like me, are obsessed with kind of the analytics of how the company is performing or where the leads are coming from or what the sales teams are doing, you can have some nice um, graphs that you can basically customize. And there's lots of different types of reports based on different information that you want to view. And you can just go in and out of these different reports. I'm not going to go into any detail at this stage, but they can be customized. At the top left here, we've got uh, a navigation menu. And um, the system, HubSpot very much starts with contacts. And then when we come on to things like the account-based marketing uh, element of the system, uh, later and personas, we can come into things like target lists and um, the sort of wider list that you can save and adopt. Um, Shebang, I'm going to come into conversations uh, a little bit and talk about how you can actually collate all of that information about the interaction with contacts as well. Uh, we'll look at that. Um, I'm not going to go too much into sales, uh, to marketing, sorry, other than I'm going to just show you how you can custom uh, some things called smart rules, which we'll we have a look at. And then I'm going to have a look at sales here. So you can do some nice, clever things around forecasting. We can do quotes through the system and we can also manage the whole deal process. And then we're going to talk about uh, automation within the system. Um, and again, I'm going to show you some of those, uh, an example of a workflow, which is from the graph that uh, um, the schema that Bex showed you a little bit earlier. What I'm not really going to go into at the moment is a service desk, which uh, you can manage ticketing and kind of contact with clients afterwards, but I'm not going to go into that uh, too much. On, on the right of the screen here is kind of management of the accounts uh, and kind of quick search tools. Um, the system also integrates with uh, something called a market marketplace and HubSpot has just uh, celebrated, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, its thousands integration with different external apps. So as an example, um, the system is not an account package, but it integrates with products like Sage and Xero. So within the app store, you can connect those products and you can then make it a much bigger system. Uh, to deal with all of your needs. So it helps you to kind of build out from that point of view. Okay, I'm going to start with contacts here. Uh, I'm going to go into uh, just um, my list of contacts here. And it brings me initially a list. Now I could do a quick search up on the top right here for a particular person. I could do a search here for a particular person if I wanted to. Um, but if I just wanted to see a list of uh, contacts on here, I could narrow that down by salesperson. So I, if I want to see who uh, Bex is dealing with, I can just narrow down that search. 
Maybe I want to use some additional filters just to search on particular type of leads if we're doing a bit of a campaign here. So I could just search on all of those who are connected and she hasn't got any of those or any of those she's attempted to contact. I haven't got any of those. So I could, but I could use those filters. Um, and then there's additional filters here that we can use. So we can add in some additional rules. So within uh, a record, a, a contact record, there's all this different functionality that you can add in here of information about that person. Uh, and again, there's lots of custom fields you can add in. So all of those you can create your own unique lists with. And then you can actually add them to this list here and you can save the views. And then you can actually just look at your own contacts. And you can see here, I've pinned lots of different types of lists that we can go back and review. Now, in this instance, I want to search for one of my contacts called James. Oh, hang on. Let me just uh, get rid of that filter. I want to search for someone called James Key here. So I'm going to search for James. And I'm going to click and open him. Now, what I want to show you here is the way the, the simplicity of HubSpot is whenever I go into a contact or if I go into a company record, I go into a deal page, the system looks exactly the same. So it's going to be very familiar when you go into a record. So in this example here, I've got on the left hand side here some personal information about James here. So I can click uh, on the drop down of this consultant team here, and we've got contact information about James. You can put lots of different information in there. Now, the example I've got set up in this demo version is actually set up for a prospect that we wanted to work with, and they're a financial company. They wanted to capture lead uh, information about mortgages and loans and things like that. So you can see I've got lots of information where the system has been customized about broker deals, and loan details. But I could go into another example here um, where I might, I, I'm might i set up as a contact with one of our clients where they are a telecommunications company. So they've got lots of technical information set up here about the kind of services that I use um, and um, you know what sort of subscriptions I've got. I'm not gonna play around with that because that's actually my, my record with them. Um, but you can see here, and then if I go into our own set up within our own CRM here, we, we just keep it very simple with contact information. So you can very much custom the system with the type of information that is relevant to your business there. In the middle section here, we've got some an activity feed. Um, now, this will keep a chronological history of any activity within the record that you've dealt with with this particular case, in this case, a, a chap called James. Shebang, it will also keep uh, any interaction, the system links with things like Outlook, chat, social contact, and it will pull that information into here. I'm going to show you another area where you can actually have a kind of dashboard where you manage all the interaction with all of your clients, but it will actually capture that data within here as well. Just as an example at the top here, we can see that it's got, you're able to record information on any notes on that particular uh, contact, emails, calls, tasks, meetings. I'm going to use an example here of creating an email. And I've bought up here an already branded uh, email because that's set up within the system. And I can customize, uh, customize an email uh, to this particular um, person. And what I can do is I can write my email as you would normally do. And this is going to link with uh, Gmail. It's going to link with Outlook. Um, uh, so it's connecting with any service that you might use. But it's got some really clever things that we can do at this point. For instance, let's say I want to um, book a meeting um, with uh, James. What I can do here is I can actually insert a link to my calendar. Oh, sorry, let me do that. Oh, let me just go back in. Here we go. And what I can do here is it's going to link with my calendar and it's going to give it's going to show them any availability for days where I've got availability and allow them to book in a meeting straight into my diary. Nice and clever. 
The other things I can do is maybe I'm talking to this person about things like uh, account-based marketing, as Dan has been speaking, but maybe the term account-based marketing just hasn't resonated with, uh, with James yet. So what I can do is I can add in here maybe saved knowledge base articles or snippets of information which might be useful to that person. So again, I can just add in, you know, you can save bits of information that you can use on a reoccurring basis. Or maybe you want to link them to a document which is going to tell them more about that information. And again, this is just creating a hyperlink where it's going to link me to a document and it's going to show them that on a web basis. Now, depending on time here, this is going to do something very clever for me, because as soon as James has opened this document, it's actually going to record it within the system as an activity that he's opened and what time he's opened that document. But it's also sending me an email to say, James just opened that guide, digital guide for marketing managers, so that I, I know that he's very interested and that perhaps he really, you know, he's worth following up. The other thing you can do really cleverly, if you want to, uh, if you want to get a little bit flash is say you want to personalize this email to this person, you can actually connect with a piece of software, which will allow you to record, and I'm not going to do it now, a personalized video to this person, and it will embed that little snippet video. Hi, James, been trying to speak to you. I know you're busy. It would be great to catch up. I really want to talk to you about whatever it might be. So and again, it just is all about that relationship side of things. So you can, can you include those things. Can you insert uh, YouTube videos as well in case if it's your brand or is it? Um, you, would, you, would have to put, you would have to put in the URL for that, but you could do that at this point, yeah. Would because, that just be a URL or would that be a preview? Like they it, can won't see be a pre, it won't be a preview um, at the moment. And again, um, HubSpot is a fluid product. Um, at the moment, it is just, I think there's a couple of products, but this Vidyard product is one that, uh, that it links with to show that preview. Does, does that kind of make sense for everybody? Does that, uh, does, does that make sense? Um, okay, so I could send that and that's gonna record uh, that up here and I can see the date and time that I got that. And if James responded to me, the update to that thread would actually come back into here. So I would be able to see uh, that that response from him. Um, you can, when things like phone calls, you can actually, again, the system links with some VoIP software, um, or you can just log a call and it will allow you to customize things like when you, you know, have you left a message? Do you want to, uh, does that need following up? And you can create ongoing tasks either for yourself or for someone else to chase that up. Just very quickly, Nick, I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to pop something in the um, in the chat. It's just an interesting the the HubSpot. Uh, sorry, the YouTube question, Shabank, because as Nick said, it's it's not as um, uh, in terms of YouTube and that side of things. It's not as effective as when you've got those other uh, you know kind of widgets or plugins, if you like, like Vidyard. But the what you can do, there are things like a GIF, so you could have like an image or a visual or something of that video. And then that could link through to the URL. So then it would be like, click here for the full video. So there are still ways of making it quite enticing and visual. It just perhaps won't have the same level of functionality as a couple of those other examples that, that Nick was showing. But I've just popped something in the chat so you can see that there are ways. It's just not exactly the same as the, the way that Nick was showing you that ability to be able to get that video in there. Perfect, thank you. No problem. Now on the, on the right here, um, the system will link through to a company, um, which I'm going to go into in a second. If you've got any deals or uh, prospects or however you term it, the language is slightly different for everybody. We call them deals in here, but it might be transaction sales. You can see a list of any sales you're doing with that particular person. Um, and then you can also see how they're interacting with you. So that uh, attribution that Dan was talking about, he kind of related to it in terms of LinkedIn, and you can do it with other channels as well. It will show you that integration down there. I talked about the record here for James linking with his company. So if I click on uh, Allen & Co Limited here, you're going to see a very similar page. It looks exactly the same as a contact record, except here it shows me that we're in a company. And at the top here, it shows me that we're in Anunco's record. 
I can see all related contacts to this company here. And the other thing it will do, although I can't show you in this demo version, because this is a completely made up company, I'm going to go into a real life person here. Um, when you go into a company, what the system will do is it will integrate back with LinkedIn and it will show publicly available information about that company. So a description of that company, how many employees, what the turnover is. So it's got some nice, clever functionality that you've got built in there. You can also link straight here into Google and do searches for that company. Um, so again, it's kind of very intuitive for searching and researching potential customers you might be working with. OK, I'm going back to my, my demo set of data here. And just while I'm on this section, I just really wanted to talk about some clever things you can do with um, uh, targeting, targeted accounts, for instance. So our, if you deal with a small number of clients, um, but you have relationships with a number of different people within that company, you can create them as a targeted client. And what you can do is through what a single page here, it's there's just a really nice page where you can see all of the interaction with those people. You can see the different relationships. And you as you come down here, all of that nice information, that nice, those nice analytics are all in one place for you to have a look at. So again, if you're having monthly man, uh, sales meetings or if you just want to keep an eye on what's going on with those particular high net worth potential contacts and clients um, and prospects, all of that information, all in one place. I'll talk briefly about the scalability about the system now, uh, as Thomas brought up, uh, and Nick brought up. Um, the, the system, um, there's, there's four different versions of HubSpot. There's a free version, something called a starter version, a professional version, and an enterprise version. Um, typically, um, the, the, the starter version um, gives you quite a lot of the functionality. And if you're dealing with just a small number of contacts, it will give you quite a lot of the features. Um, the pro version, slightly, it, it's, it is more expensive, but it gives you a lot more functionality. It's a kind of um, decision making about which version is right for you, uh, which we would, I think, on an individual basis, discuss with you what product is right. But we work in terms of supporting businesses either in implementation of the system or ongoing marketing, we work with customers who have pretty much every version of the software. Um, and it's, it's very much scalable depending on what you wanna get out of it. So um, we, we can have a further discussion offline about what, what, what product is right. Um, the other thing I wanna just show at this point is again, Dan, Dan referred to, to account-based marketing. And one of the ways that we can customize the account-based marketing is you can create lists based on the different personas. So here I've got a couple of different examples based on people who might you might consider an influencer or a champion, or depending on their decision-making ability or buying roles. And these can be dynamic, lists that you can create. So as you have different marketing collateral you want, or you want to run automation with them, so have uh, different collateral going to them at different times, interspersed with uh, maybe reminders to follow those people up and contact them. Um, it will allow you to do that through these personalized lists. Now, one thing you can do there um, in terms of personas, I've got an example one here that we've called rather uh, facetiously Crafty Cameron. And um, what you can do here is you can actually put information about those people, what, what your kind of description of them is, what sort of roles they might have, what their goals for the company is, what their challenges are, and then a bit more information on the demographics of that person. Um, so the sort of income um, that they might get, how they're educated, and then just tell them a bit, a bit of a story about them. So all of that helps you to very much tailor who you are targeting. Okay, so you've got the data in there. Um, you now want to do something with that person. So I've shown you you can kind of book meetings in with them. I've shown that you, you that you can keep uh, contact with them, maintain contact. Maybe the next stage is 
you want to, they've asked you for a quote on um, uh, for your services. So I'm going to come across to the sales tab here and come to quotes. And um, what I'm going to do at this point, this is a list of uh, different quotes we've got in the system. I'm going to create a new one here. And I'm going to do it for a company called Helmet Enterprises. And there's a few different styles of templates that can be set up all with your own branding on it. You can put things like expiration dates on there. You can put in snippets for things like um, purchase terms and maybe comments that you want to say, depending on that person. And then what we can do here is select the contact. So I'm actually just going to put in there. I'm just going to randomly pick someone. Who's this being sent from? And then what we can do is we can add in, you can see here, actually, for some reason, that this has already picked out a load of different um, um, options for um, mobile transactions. So let's, uh, you, you can actually customize this. So you can actually add in line items and you've got a product like library. So you can actually create a different list of products that you might be selling and then add those in to that list there. Okay, so actually this is the only one with a any information in, you can ignore the rest of them. And that is then going to create a personalized quote, which we can either print off and get a signature for, maybe you want to get an electronic signature. And there's also option here for online payments. Now, once you've created that quote, that is going to be sent through to the person and it's gonna give them a nice visual look of what that quote looks like. Or you can embed it with an email there, okay. So once you've created the quote, that quote is very likely to show up on a deal board. And um, you will see here, uh, a number of different statuses here on this deal board, which can be represented like this, or it can be represented in a list format, different deal stages. I prefer the Kanban board my, look myself. Um, and what we can do here is it's really simple just to navigate through the system. So let's say I'm dealing with this particular deal. I can go in, I've got details about the deal on the right hand side here. Uh, so I can see things like um, the status of this deal. I can add in notes at this point. I've got different actions that we can do at this point. But I can also just drop and drag this to the next stage. So it allows you just to manage that your, your, your sales process. And you can see down the bottom here, uh, for forecasting purposes, I can see the value of each of the deals in these stages. Like everything else within HubSpot, each of these different stages is able to be customized uniquely to you as a business. So an example of that, a deal pipeline we've set up for another one of our clients here. You can see the deal stages are completely different here. This is a demo version, so uh, you'll have to, uh, there's not a lot of data in there. But what I wanted to show you here is this is set up slightly differently. So when I go from one stage to another, what the system is going to do at this point is actually have a set of either questions that need we want to make sure have been asked, or they can either be just um, a request for them to be set up, uh, answered, or they can be mandatory answers like these are. So you can the asterisk denotes that these are mandatory questions that have to be answered before it will let you go to the next stage. So you can very much control the quality of your sales pipeline as it goes. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions at that point? Anything that doesn't make sense to anybody at that point? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so really- Just on that day, sorry, just very yeah. quickly. I think what's interesting or, or definitely what's coming through at this point uh, is, is the scalability aspect in the sense that it's not, like you could deal, 
deal in this way with a thousand accounts or you could deal in this way with 10 because actually what it is is it's about um it's about the process more than the volume so i know i mentioned earlier that i'm working with a client they're working relatively low numbers they're a multi-million pound turnover business and they've got uh, a portfolio of 80 businesses and you know that's their entire customer base but we're talking about tens of millions of pounds worth of um of turnover so i think what's interesting is that their needs in a crm are to give that really high quality communication service maximize every cross-selling opportunity but it's not to an enormous enormous portfolio they work in very very small numbers and in a way the smaller the numbers the even more you can go perhaps granular in terms of some of that persona stuff that nick was talking about and and the detailed elements of it so i just think it does show that you've got those two ends of the scale and it can be effective for for that and i think that links up with it um sort of tying in if i think about now kind of automation with this um um what one of our clients um who is in the automotive industry one, one of the things he he produces um customized vehicles for 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 clients uh, and tools for client uh, you know, for, for the vehicles and one of the things he does is the the manufacturing process of these vehicles can take quite a long time 12 15 weeks or so and during that process what he really didn't want to do was have silence um so he very much wanted between the different stages here uh of going from the order process through to it being delivered he wanted to make sure that those clients were kept in touch i think you know and and very much at that point um uh communications so using the automation here again when we move from within the different stages here if we start looking at automation here these workflows and this is what um this is now in the area that bex was showing you earlier we can set up different workflows so i'm going to go into one that is the called smart fix post sale um, and it will allow you depending on different rules that you set and this is kind of a visualization of what uh, Bex showed you earlier. It will allow you to set different rules. And depending on what the outcome of our certain things, it will allow you then to change the rules. So here, the client didn't engage. If I just go left a little bit, it will say the client replied. So depending on the outcomes of these, it's going to take me down different paths. And you'll see as I go down here, the options you're going to see, and in fact, if I zoom out, and there's going to be a lot on stage on screen here, just because I just want to show you how it kind of works. There's an awful lot of different options that it gives you there. So again, these are these are the kind of swan below the water, very complicated to set up, and it takes a bit of thought process. But once it's set up, um, it will determine what happens action wise with that client next, whether it be you need to speak to that person whether it needs to be there needs to get some sort of visual written email uh, or they there is some sort of uh, action needed whether it's something internally you need to send a document out all of those can be controlled through these workflows within the system can i just um, add to that nick yeah um, sorry, just because I know there's at least one person in the room that when I've spoken to them about automation, um, there were concerns, and it's happened with a lot of people, there were concerns that it took away the personal aspect and it took away the human side um, of that communication, particularly after the sale of what's happening next. So although this is a, a solution to cut down on that time, at no point does it actually cut out that human touch if it's needed. Which is why um, you can add into the automations things like if there's negative feedback, um, if somebody's not happy, they've always got that option to go back to somebody as well. So this is a even more um, solution. Sorry, you want me to come closer to my mic, don't you? Uh, yeah, we couldn't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I, I do know there's a problem with my mic at the minute. Um, but yeah, I, I was just wanted to um, just reiterate that. This doesn't cut out the human process. It doesn't make your process less personal. It just saves you time and actually allows you to 
make those light touches with a client um, without actually needing to kind of do it all yourself. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to reiterate that. Thanks. Yeah, if if anything, it helps, doesn't it? Really, because exactly. it actually because it depending on that contact, it will change the rules automatically. So uh, it, it it's just it's just quite intelligent from that point of view. Just, Nick, just one can, thing I yeah. can I just ask a quick question just whilst it was it's relevant to the automation piece can that also be say for example um automation is really helpful from from one aspect and obviously speaking to prospective leads and clients but also can be helpful information for us as well obviously so do 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 um you get a, a notification through HubSpot uh, th or through your email as well that this person hasn't yeah. responded and as such we have done this because Absolutely. obviously yeah. you know I, I understand it's the not maybe the personal touch but it's I guess the relinquishing of control in automation really where you let go of something else so you know that is where the thinking comes into the process design yeah. right at the beginning but obviously, it's funny because in that seven days delay, say, for example, you may, you, we may as humans may have learned an extra bit of information, and et cetera, and we may want to change the automation or may want to go back in and, and adjust the flow. So it, I was just about to say, whilst it, if, say, for example, somebody hasn't engaged with um, a white paper, a case study, et cetera, do we get notified of that as well? Yeah. So there's different, again, within the rules that you can configure within the system, there's different options. Do you want to be notified? Do you want to be notified by email? Uh, do you want it to be a task? Do you want it to show up on a report for you? So you can create reports where you have a dashboard which says you've got 10 of these 10 people haven't been noted, you know, haven't responded to an email you sent out or a white paper that they viewed. And then in one go, you can batch those 10 people and then send them a follow up as an example. Or that could be, again, automated. Or you could just at that point go through the list and log that you've spoken to those people. So, yeah, there's lots of different options. But at every point, those notifications can inform you of what is going on. You just choose whether that is something that's relevant that you need to know or whether it isn't or not. Because again, you don't want to be bombarded. So it's it's where it's relevant. That's yeah, important. and I was just thinking as well, for, and why I said that was some of the um, organizations that we work with, we work in different departments of said organization as well. So, you know, it in the things not to have, um, apologies, just going straight out uh, to um, individuals, you know, we work, we, we work across multiple departments at C level, uh, at C level and departmental level. So I mean, there's information that comes in from everywhere, and obviously yeah. there is lots of different kind of narratives and strings we have to balance in our communication. So it's just it's it, there is something crying inside of us that wants to release control to make things easier for automation, but at the same time we want to hold X amount of it to be able to make the right decision in terms of that automation. It can change at, at multiple times. Uh, and I think I think the system is fluid from that point of view. And it is very much a bit of a test it and see, because as you say, you don't you, you need to get the balance right. And um, the, the system can be adjusted at any point. So if if you're going too way too much one way, you can you can set up different rules or change the rules or set up a different automation process uh, accordingly. But that is very much it's it's a little bit like if we run a if we run a Google Ads campaign for a client, we don't just set that campaign up and let it run. We do a ninety day proof of concept, and it's the same when you set up set up a CRM. You've got to it's not going to be right first time round. You've got to invest in it it's got to be an iterative process and sometimes you go you know what that's good I like it have we made that way too complicated let's simplify it a little bit and let's just make it easier so it is it is an ongoing process to do that I think um where I want to go next um so I'm going to come back to the communication I haven't forgotten shebang I'm going to show you that that 
communicating with people in a second. But before I do that, something that kind of leads on to that and talks about the account-based marketing as well is if I, I just want to show you an example of a landing page here. And this is, HubSpot's got some really clever functionality in it, whereby um, if you're going to drive, uh, drive email contact or blogs through your website or potentially landing pages, um, there is something called smart content. Now, depending on whether your website is built through HubSpot or you've got an external site, there's a further conversation that needs to be had, but that's not for now. Um, what you can do is create some things called smart rules. And if you think back to that list that I had earlier, what we can do is we can do things such as choose a contact list membership or a lifestyle sta stage. We can choose a particular list. And then what we can do is we can come in and we can, now I've chosen those rules, I can change this content to say something different, depending on maybe the location of that customer, the messaging that you want to do. So something I would always say, a, a managing director's uh, um, motivation for buying HubSpot, for instance, is different to a sales director. It's different to the FD's rule, uh, you know, reasons for buying it. And therefore, the kind of messaging that each of those people want to see is going to be different. The financial director wants to know, is it going to save me money? The sales manager wants to know, is this going to bring us more leads? And the MD wants to know, oh, overall, is this going to be better for our business? So you can custom those rules accordingly. But we can do even more things in like that. So we can use some things in here where we can do things like uh, customize, uh, personalize these messages. So you can come in here and you can put things like, oh, sorry, I've clicked on contact. We can put in here things like first name and we can, cont we can make it so actually, um, I can say, Dan, were you aware that we're a, an award-winning um, team of digital marketers? Um, and you can put in lots of different things. You can embed video again that's relevant just in this particular instance for this particular contact. Hopefully that makes sense to you, but you can do that against a, across different collateral, whether it's, uh, as I say, email, blogs, whether it might be... Um, uh, landing pages and it will track that information it will track those people as they land on your page and it will keep it within the analytics of the company and uh, their, their contact record okay um just while i'm on marketing one of the things that you can do if i come to social and this kind of ties in a little bit with um with the contacts here what you can do is you can use the system for your social channels. You can connect up LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, and you can actually in one place control your social interaction. So if you want to create content from here, you can create calendars. You can also do the replies from here and you can actually do the shares. So everything you can manage in one place across all your channels. So that's where we've got things like conversations. But the other place we can do this, if I go back up to here, we've actually got a, a heading that says conversation here. And you can custom this to link with things such as uh, channels here. We're going to channels. We can link it to things such as your Outlook, things like live chat on the system, forms, messenger. So there's different channels you can link that to. And in one place, oh, sorry, let me go back into the inbox again. Any of those interactions, you can manage those conversations in here in one place. So again, incoming, outgoing, they're all, you can manage those conversations. Is that the sort of thing you were talking about, Shebang? Yeah, uh, something similar, yes. Okay, um, so again, that's something we can customize. You can actually pull in, again, there's some external resources through the marketplaces you can use to help you on that as well. So there's lots of different ways of interacting and make it, uh, you know, um, there's also a support 
uh, element to this where you can have greater interaction and things like, uh, I'm not going to go into this now, but things like feedback surveys as well, and you can share knowledge okay. bases. There's lots and lots of different ways that you can communicate and manage your client relationships. So in short, the customer service can also be a part of HubSpot. Is that what it is, a ticketing system, or is it uh, something different? No, it's built in, but the degree to which you would want that we would need to have a bit of a chat about just to work out the specifics. Um, it's not quite Zendesk, but it will, yeah. you know, it, 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 it is a good system. And is Zendesk integrated? Can it be integrated, as you say? Yeah, it can be as well. It yeah, it, it's yeah, funny. Bizarrely, you know, HubSpot will link with lots of other CRMs. It will link with things, it will link with Salesforce. It will link with, uh, you know, lots and lots of different, CRMs that integrate but give additional functionality to it, additional power to it. So it can, all, of course, it does, can also integrate into its AdWords and pretty much all the information which you have for the client will then automatically come over um, to, to HubSpot. Is that correct, isn't it? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can create your AdWords there. So from my perspective, um, I've kind of given you a bit of a flying overview, a very generic overview of the system. I suppose at this point, really just invite questions, really. That's Look at that, Nick. You hit the nail on the head. You've given <laughs> everybody everything they need to know. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Like, <laughs> Sometimes as well, it's good to let these things sit. I suppose if anybody um, uh, obviously has any questions that come afterwards, you know, we'll be sure that we're all connected on LinkedIn and then you can reach out and ask any questions there. Um, but yeah, did anybody more, have any? Sorry, it's more about It's more about sitting down and understanding what we currently have because there's a lot of, the question, there's a lot of questions because uh, it needs to be, yeah. So uh, the good thing about the system is the marketing and the sales can be combined together because currently we have a different system for customer service. We have a different system for sales CRM. We have a different system to track marketing. And then of course, it all depends the commercial aspect and how flexible the system is. I know the HubSpot is a lot flexible. I just need to see yeah. what kind of flexibility plus getting all the data from the old CRM and getting onto the new CRM, that, that, that's a massive, massive okay. task as well. So yeah. So all, they're, they're all absolutely fundamental, each of those points. And I think, what we would do for anyone who would like a further conversation on HubSpot, um, Bex and I would come and have a chat. We'd sit down, understand the systems that you're using at the moment, understand what you like about them, what you don't like about it, what you want to do, what your goals are for getting it right, how the migration process works, and fundamentally how it can then the smooth transition from one system to another. But Every client we work with, we work with dozens and dozens of HubSpot uh, clients. Every single person that uses the system uses it in a completely different way. We do not have two customers that use it in the same way, which um, creates well, interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah, you know, setup and configuration is, you know, it, 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 it takes a lot of thought process. Um, but... It's one of those that we plan out, we set out schemas, we have a project plan, um, we set up a, you know, I, I think the, everyone has to be realistic that you're not going to switch one system off one day and you're going to switch another system off on the next day and it's all going to be perfect. It is, there is a migration period where you have to, um, if you like the configuration of the system, getting it right, getting the back end set up right, correctly, will mean once you actually do the switch over and we do a lot of testing in between, it will, it will then work effectively. And that's, that's probably the most important part of it. Get, get the configuration set up right, you'll have a system worth using. Um, most people don't use CRMs properly for probably two reasons. One, it's, it's, it's badly configured, it's badly, the architecture is bad. And two, there is no enforcement of how the system is used. So a product like HubSpot allows you to really manage the enforcement of how the system is used. And when I talk about enforcement, I'm not talking about micromanaging, but it is about good data. 
no CRM is any use to anybody if you've got bad data in there. So uh, we worked with a client recently where they, they, they migrated from three or four systems and there were so many stakeholders that they made it overly complicated. Just It was just ridiculous and it ended up no one was using it. So we had to revisit after six months and then go back and say, actually, you know what? Let us take control now. Let's just simplify how the system is going to be used. And we stripped it back. And yep, now they're getting a lot more engagement with them. Does it support multi-branding? So if you like about four or five different training names and there's agents working on diff like one agent working across multiple brands, is that easy to configure? Uh, so uh, the system is essentially set up with one brand. Um, it, it is... It is set up that you would need to go to one of the more expensive packages to have multiple branding set up with it. So that, that, that can be a part of the package. It, it can be it, part it, of okay. it, but it would be what it is one of the more advanced features of the system rather than within the the more economic versions of the, the system. So I think this is more to just now to understand what the commercial is, if is that feasible or not. That, that, that's what it is. Yeah. I think I think it would be a really good idea maybe just to have a chat, you know, uh, because yeah, yeah. We, it sounds like there's a lot of information that probably we need to ask the right questions. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. And then yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can then look at what you know again, what one thing, and, and again, you've worked with us long long enough. If if there's uh, if we don't feel it's the right product for you. I, I, we will be the first ones to say this isn't this isn't a suitable product for you. Uh, I walked away from a quite a big HubSpot deal about three weeks ago because it was very clear that the functionality they wanted just wasn't going to work. It, it would have been very easy just to go through the motion setting it up, uh, it, you know, as an information onboarding project and then kind of walk away, but it, it wasn't it wasn't the right product for them. Perfect. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, we can. No, I'll just. Yeah, we we probably uh, we have to draft through what we're currently working on. We have to show the system we're working yeah. on, then we can just pick it from there. Yeah. One one thing I would recommend to anyone who's looking to implement any kind of technology, um, and without sounding like a parent or a school teacher, um, one of the things I would do. Um, without any question, and, and, and I, I was a bit flippant with uh, when Dad introduced me earlier, but I've got 18 years um, managing migrations and, and software um, in integrations and, and setups. Uh, one one of the things that um, is really important is to understand what you want to get out of a system. So I always recommend people doing a list. What is it that you must have out of a system? What is it that, that is a preference from a system? And then conversely, what is it you don't want a system to do? If you understand what you want to get out of it, if you understand the goals for what, why you're doing this, you're going to understand a few things. You're going to understand, actually, does the product that you currently use, does it, can it be configured to work how you want? And you can save yourself a load of money and there may be tweaks to do. Two, actually, are you just not the sort of company that is going to use a CRM effectively? Or three, what is the what do you want to get out of what you move to next? Brilliant. Any any more for any more? Any final questions? I popped our um, LinkedIn's in the chat, so you've got uh, Nick, Bex, and myself. Um, so sort of double check if there were any final final questions before we before we wrap up no marvelous fab well listen thank you ever so much everybody i hope that was um that was beneficial um bex will be in touch with a follow-up you'll get access to the deck and as i say there's also a recording from today as well um we will be having more sessions throughout the year wagada we're sort of changing up a little bit shaking it up in terms of what those sessions are going to look like so there's some really exciting stuff going on behind the scenes what we're going to be doing is a lot more kind of snappy regular updates for you as well in terms of changes in the industry things that you might need to stay on top of really useful insight sessions 
sessions with various specialists across the team. So there's loads of exciting things going on behind uh, behind the scenes. Um, Ray, yes, absolutely. I can see you've had a bit of a connection issue. That's absolutely fine. You'll get the recording so you can actually watch back the element that you might have missed and you'll also get the full deck too. So you'll actually have the recording of the, of the whole demo too. So that's something that you can access then in, in your own time. Um, and um, yeah, um, it might even be behind a gateway so that we can put you in a funnel. That that bit was a joke. That was a joke. But no, you'll get you'll get the recording and everything, so you'll be able to access everything. Um, brilliant. No, really glad to hear that it was enjoyable and good for you as well. So so that's fab. Um, I would always say as well, um, shameless plug. Don't hesitate to jump onto our Google My Business listing. Do feel free to leave Wagadera a review or on our trust pilot. As we mentioned before, they're incredibly valuable to all businesses, including us. Bex will send a couple of links for that over as well in the in the follow up. So if you have found it beneficial, we would massively appreciate any kind of online review. Um, the more that we can deliver these kind of sessions um for either value for money investment or even free as well is is very much an aim of ours so we want to be able to give you that that content to kind of fuel your, your marketing thoughts for the year ahead especially during the pandemic so um uh, the more that obviously that's that's well received the more that we're able to to do that kind of thing as well so no it was really really good to meet some of you for the first time do reach out get connected with us on linkedin if you've got any further questions don't hesitate to reach out but otherwise on behalf of all of us we wish you all the very best have a great rest of the day enjoy the weekend that's not too far off now and and good luck with hubspot cheers thanks everybody cheers, daniel thank, thank you, you. Thank you.